Welcome to Seed Sovereignty and Seed Saving. Can you move to the next slide, Kelly? Great. Well, everybody's joining. And for those of you uh, who have never been on a Zoom call, <laughs> we thank you for joining us tonight. Um, housekeeping items are that you will be muted when you join and your cameras will be turned off. That is for bandwidth reasons. It will help everybody uh, see the slides um, happen more, more rapidly and efficiently. Um, we will answer questions at the end of the session. So um, please feel free to put your questions either in the Q&A section on the bottom of your page or in the chat. Either way, we'll capture them and we'll feed them back at the end in a 30 minute Q&A session. Um, there is a live transcript option. It's a button at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to see the words in print um, and you have audio issues, anything like that, feel free to click live transcript and it should print out the text that's being spoken at the bottom of your screen. This session is being recorded. You may get a little, um, a little notification. Please say yes and accept that it is being recorded. We will make it available to everyone who has signed up for this, this session, whether they appeared at the time or not. Um, so this will come in an email in a day or two afterwards. And if you need any technical assistance, please chat with Vanessa Ackerman, who is our Zoom hostess tonight. Next, please. So tonight we are going to try something a little bit different. We've um, uh, we're offering this in Spanish and interpreted in in um, in English and interpreted in Spanish. So if you looked at the bottom of the screen, if you prefer to receive the audio in Spanish click the little interpretation button. And when it pops up, it'll give you an option to pick English or Spanish. So if you don't mind, pick, pick Spanish and you will hear the um, session in Spanish. Um, our interpreter this today is Carmen Cortez and we thank her very much for her service. Next. Para todas las personas que hablan eh, español y quisieran escuchar la sesión en español, hay un botón debajo de su pantalla que pueden uh, presionar para escuchar toda la sesión en español. Thank you, Carmen. Um, next, please. So these free public workshops are brought to you by the uh, CASFIS organization, Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, along with the friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden who live to support CASFIS. If you're not a member of uh, the friends, it's you get many benefits by being one, including deep discounts at local nurseries, invitations to exclusive events, and updates about the excellent work that CASFIS is doing. And of course, you get the good feeling that you're contributing to the food systems as a a non-academic and, um, and non-farmer. So this is kind of the way we can get in and, and do those things. So we're gonna put a link to the membership, which is quite inexpensive, um, into the chat. And if you'd like to join today, that would be great. Next. And this is Kelly, she's gonna introduce herself. Hi everybody, welcome. Um, my name is Kelly Matsushita Sang, and I am the assistant manager here in the farm garden. Um, I'll just briefly describe myself for purposes of access today. Um, I'm sitting in the farm office with a bunch of sampasuchil next to me, and I'm a short, um, an Asian person with short, dark hair and a lot of books behind me medium height and I'm wearing a dark t-shirt. So here at the farm, I work with uh, students, apprentices, and any other learners who come here to learn. And my focus at the farm is greenhouse management, seed production, seed saving, flower production, and growing um, nutritionally dense and culturally significant and relevant crops. Um, for me, food growing is at the heart of community wellness and liberation. And at the root of that is seed. 
Um, and so my passion is for working with SEED as a platform for creating community health and self-determination. And our ancestral and community SEED legacies are a really great reminder of our connection and responsibility to the land that we care for. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the, the Yuki tribe of the Awathwas Nation. And today, these lands are represented by the Amamutsun Tribal Band, who are the descendants of the Awathwas and Mutsun Nations, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the Central Coast. Today, the Amamutsun are working hard to fulfill their obligation to the creator to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning re efforts and the Amamutsun Land Trust. I feel that land acknowledgements are, as a practice, are not an end in themselves, but they're a practice of reminding each of us of our responsibility to find ways to uplift, honor, and support the Native and Indigenous peoples of the land that, e that each of us occupy. There are many ways to support and learn about the work of the Amamutsun Tribal Band and Land Trust. Um, this Saturday was the historic bell removal of the um, mission bell in Santa Cruz, of which the tribe has been organizing for years to do this. Um, they've recently been collaborating with Cal Fire to look at fire management practices and are also working to preserve your stock, which is a sacred cultural and religious site. Um, and this is, it was acquired in 2015 by an investor group um, and is slated to become a gravel and sand pit mine um, with both huge impacts to the people to whom this site is sacred as well as to the ecosystem. Um, and so overwhelming public objection is essentially needed to prevent um, the mining permit from going forward. So please um, visit this website um, to learn more and also submit objections to the pit mine. So today we're going to look at seed saving for resilient farms and gardens, um, look at seed sovereignty and what that means for us, think a little bit about how to crop plan for seed saving and seed production, and also talk a little bit about mating systems and reproductive biology in terms of thinking about seed. So to be a farmer or gardener in the past and not be a seed keeper was something that was unheard of. The two roles used to be inseparable, but in many parts of the world, this is still the case. Uh, we each come from incredible lineages of seed keepers and we're all deeply connected to our ancestors through our seeds and their stories. Seed saving allows us to capture the knowledge of the season and the land and to transmit the knowledge that is learned onto the next generation of plants and people. It's an incredible opportunity to create plants that are more adapted to our farms with specific traits or bred for much needed climate resilience. With the most recent United Nations um, climate, global climate report, we know that at this point, no matter what kind of change we make, the climate is going to get more extreme for the next 30 years um, irreversibly, meaning that we'll experience more drought, more heat waves, more cold waves, and unpredictable and unseasonable weather and temperature cycles. Here in Santa Cruz, we've seen more erratic weather, hotter periods, colder periods, and just unpredictable weather in general. And of course, we see the droughts of now and the fires of now and last year. Um, the left is an image of the Loch Loman Reservoir with very low water, and the right is an image of last year's um, fires. And so with changing weather patterns, we know that it's not just the actual temperature ranges that impact plants, but the cascade of resulting impacts that affect our farm and garden ecosystems, such as dramatically increased pest pressures and temperatures that impact insect life cycles, 
or changing conditions that create environments for diseases to be present and to spread, such as fungal diseases. So in these times, we have to support all the genetic diversity possible we can in our systems to provide opportunity for our seeds and our plants to adapt to changing conditions. It's gonna be of ever increasing importance that our plants have traits that allow them to be drought tolerant, to experience wider ranges of unpredictable temperatures, and even to have the ability to grow and photosynthesize through and oftentimes it's the diverse genes of land raised seeds or varieties that are closer to their wild crop relatives that have traits that are significant for climate adaptability. And while plant breeders and geneticists have, are working through this process of adaptation through selection and roguing, farmers are inherently working on this selection process by continuing to grow and steward their crops. Um, on the right hand side is an image of Theosinte, the first image, which is the great grandmother ancestor of corn. And on the right, we see some of the modern versions of corn um, that we eat today. So seed saving though and seed keeping is more than just taking care of germplasm and the preservation of genetic material. We know that genetic diversity across the globe is linked inherently with the preservation of cultural diversity and community in place. It's a reweaving of the social and cultural fabric of our communities, which happens through seed sovereignty. So why is seed sovereignty important today? Um, I'd like to share a little bit of what roots me in seed work. So Vandana Shiva says that seed sovereignty is the foundation of food sovereignty. If farmers do not have their own seeds or access to open pollinated varieties that they can save, improve, and exchange, they have no seed sovereignty and consequently no food sovereignty. The lexicon of food says that seed sovereignty reclaims seeds and biodiversity as commons and public good. And the IPC for food sovereignty says the right to continue sustaining and evolving relationships with plants, animals, and nature, which is a condition for their well being and dignity and life and dignity. The last definition is a definition that I really resonate with um, thinking about seed sovereignty as the right of people to be in relationship with their seed. It's the right of communities to steward and take care of and grow with their seed. So we have to ask, why is it that building seed sovereignty movements has become critical for the survival and health of communities everywhere? And to answer this, we need to know a little bit about the context of seeds around the world. Seed systems rooted in principles of sovereignty where people self-determine how to save, sell, and distribute the seeds of their community are actually the means of production that have allowed people to feed the world for thousands of years and are actually still how the majority of the world produces and accesses seeds. Seed sovereignty creates the foundation for agroecology. Agroecological food systems are still the means by which the majority of small scale farm peasant farmers around the world produce their food. And these peasant farmers and indigenous peoples feed 70% of the world and are critical in protecting genetic biodiversity. Globally, a majority of farmers are still saving seed around the world as a means to grow their food. Many of these seed savers are women and many of these seed keepers are elders. But seeds are not as easy to access in other countries as in the US, unless you're saving them yourself. Here in the US, we actually have quite a robust seed system and access to relatively lots of seed compared to many parts of the world. Um, and yet still many farmers in the US are not saving seed or not saving a substantial amount of their own seed. We know that there are major threats to seed sovereignty around the world. We know that there are trade agreements that force, that force countries 
to essentially employ intellectual property protection on seeds. And this happens through trade and investment agreements such as NAFTA um, or joining a, when countries join the World Trade Organization. Uh, we know that there are market regulations that also are a threat to seed sovereignty, um, such as it's uh, DUS uh, standards in different countries around the world, which stands for distinct, uniform, and stable, um, which requires that seeds have particular uh, qualities of uniformity in order to be included in compulsory seed catalogs and to be on the market. But a lot of seeds that are um, diverse and um, from different communities don't fit within these standards. We know that patent and biosafety laws around the world are a major threat to seed sovereignty. We also see breeding frameworks that are based on white supremacy and individualism as a major threat to seed sovereignty around the world. For instance, recognizing that a formal plant breeder's small tweak on the last generation of a particular um, plant variety is something that you can patent. Instead of acknowledging generations and generations of community and collective knowledge that has shaped a seed to be how it is. We have to understand seed sovereignty as intrinsically collective. Um, seeds are linked to human communities with their way of life and social organizations, cosmovisions and cultures, um, and collective knowledge systems. So to build seed sovereignty movements that support communities to care for their seeds, seed sovereignty work must reject patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. Keeping farming systems alive is the best way to keep seeds alive, says La Via Campesina. And we know that we need agroecological farming systems to support food and seed sovereignty. We know that no seed can truly exist without the community that cares for it. The seed sovereignty movements then must push against globalization. We must be working towards seed systems that promote ecological balance, public health and economic equality on a local level. Seed sovereignty movements are anti-patriarchal because they are resisting and rejecting the domination to nature approach and the reductionist viewpoint that has been applied to industrial seed production. Um, and they reject violence against the women and the earth. We can see as well the link between seed sovereignty and women's rights, recognizing the fundamental role of women around the world in food security, community health, and the reduction of poverty. We know that seed sovereignty movements must dismantle white supremacy because they require the maintenance and celebration of diversity and resist homogeneity. Preservation of biodiversity is the foundation of an agroecological system and conventional seeds don't fit these types of systems but diverse peasant seeds and regionally adapted seeds do. And we know that seed sovereignty movements are anti-capitalistic. Seeds and plants, plants produce seed abundantly, um, which is inherently an active contradiction to the scarcity model of capitalism. We have to begin to reimagine seed as part of a regenerative farming system and part of a collective heritage of sharing and evolving knowledge um, and start to move beyond a framework of private property and a framework of individual innovation. For me, seed sovereignty work is a platform for justice work, a tool to build community power, reclaim ancestral knowledge, and work towards collective liberation. Um, I work with a collective of growers uh, called Second Generation Seeds that works to preserve and steward seeds significant to the communities of the Asian diaspora. And our goal is to create collective infrastructure and resources for seed and story sharing, in order to preserve, sustain, and expand and preparing traditional and culturally significant varieties. Um, so you can find us at Second Generation Seeds. So I'm going to walk through a few crops that I've recently grown for seed so that people can get a sense of some of the things 
that are helpful to begin to think about when crop planning for seed production. This is a Korean perilla variety. Um, the green one on the left is called 38N, which has been bred and uh, stewarded by Namu Farm in a low till minimal input Korean natural farming system. The variety of perilla on the right hand side is chajogi, um, which is closer to the wild uh, ancestors of perilla. The seeds for this perilla uh, were sown in March and seedlings that were planted in May, spaced about a foot apart. It's a super incredible plant for food and medicine and can be harvested for the leaves June through August. Flowering is initiated with the shortening of days, the day length, and there's really nothing like standing in the field of a golden field of perilla, um, which is filled with bees. Um, it's an incredible part, it's an incredible plant for food and nectar resources for pollinators, um, especially the bees. And it starts to flower around September, right around this time. Perilla is self-pollinating, so we didn't need to worry about it crossing with other varieties of things on the farm. Each plant usually creates hundreds and hundreds of seeds, certainly enough for replanting yourself and probably some for eating. Um, I also have found that birds love the seeds. So you can see on the right hand side that some remay protection was helpful as the seeds started to mature. Perilla seed is usually harvested around early October here. Uh, we essentially cut and laid the dried perilla stalks in the greenhouse, a protected environment to have the seed finish maturing and to get the rest of the energy from the plant. Then we threshed the seed into a dry, clean 55 gallon drum container. And threshing is the process of essentially separating the seed from the plant. And then we used a number of different screens sizes to winnow the seed or separate the seed from the chaff and the fine dust and the sticks that were remaining. This year we are growing a saltus or wosan, or Chinese stem lettuce, for seed as well. This was sown March, March 15th, and it was planted in April, of April, late April, early May. And it's a crop that is pretty multi-purpose. Um, the leaves of the young plants are delicious for salad, and they're also great for using for lettuce wraps. Uh, we grew four varieties this year. And a month later, you actually can eat and harvest and eat the stems, um, which are tender and delicious when you peel them. And so this was early to mid June. These plants flowered at the end of June and into July. Things in the lettuce family usually have pretty heavy pollen and flowers that are that have both pollen producing and pollen receiving parts that can pollinate themselves. These plants also produce seed abundantly and don't need a ton of special treatment other than maybe some trellising and dry conditions in order for you to get good seed. We harvested the seed in early August, about two months after the market stage of the crop. And one thing about lettuce or celtus or other similar, similarly related crops. Um, the celtus is an indeterminate flowering plant, meaning that it flowers over a period of time. So in order to harvest as much seed as possible, we actually had to harvest the seed several different times. And um, one way that we harvested was just simply threshing into a clean dry bucket, as you can see here on the right hand side, if we can get it to load. Um, but you're essentially shaking things into a clean bucket.
So when thinking about crop planning, we also want to think about um, what kind of season you need to successfully mature your crops and how long of a season you need in order for your seed to mature. One thing that's really helpful to think about is if you've planted early enough. Um, and early enough in your climate. So when thinking about what types of seeds you should grow, there are a whole things, a whole list of things that I like to think about, um, including climate, um, the amount of time you have available in your growing space, the amount of space you have available, the tools, equipment, or supplies you'll you'll need to successfully grow that seed. I think about access to that seed and that plant variety um, and just your interest and community interest in it, the economics of growing a particular seed, um, whether it might be actually more economical to buy that seed or you know, some seed is very easy to grow and some takes a lot of processing time. And then I also think about building for climate resilience in your own system. So in thinking about climate, I think about season length and uh, maturation, like the cell to seed, needing a particularly long dry window, um, which is perfect in this Mediterranean climate for growing lettuce and cell to seed because we essentially are getting no rain um, until October or even November. Um, sometimes wet seeded crops or wet, <laughs> wet crops that are protected in fruits are actually uh, more resilient to having humidity in the air um, as a crop when it finishes um, compared to things like grains or things that need to be totally dry like quinoa on the right. Um, it's important to think about temperature. How long is your season and where are the temperature ranges and thresholds? What are the nighttime temperatures and maximum temperatures? How much warmth or cold is there over a season? And when will you get your first frost? It, a good question to ask is what is the optimum temperature for producing the best quality seed in your region? Uh, plants are extremely sensitive when they are producing seed, particularly because the pollen is extremely sensitive to both temperature and humidity. So a critical period in growing seed is when a plant is producing, when a plant is um, in the early stages of seed development and in the process of being pollinated. The pollen is really delicate. Pollinators also have to be happy in the environmental conditions in order to pollinate your plants. If temperatures are too cold, if there's too much rain or even overhead irrigation, insects won't be flying as actively and won't be pollinating your crops. We also like to think about how long it will take to produce this crop for seed. So we think about life cycle. How long will it take in the greenhouse? What is the typical germination time? How long will it take to grow a seedling? And then how long will that plant take in the field? And then from there, how long will it take to even produce flowers and mature seed in the field? We need to know a little bit about plant life cycles. So many of our favorite seed saving crops fall into the category of annuals, which produce mature seed in one season. And typically with annuals, you just need to think about planting early enough in the season to get mature seed before winter. Whereas um, with biennials, you actually need two seasons in order to produce mature seed. Um, biennial crops need to experience a period of vernalization, which is a period of temperature below 50 degrees for at least eight to 10 weeks so that plants can biologically be stimulated to flower. Biennials are often storage crops uh, like beets or carrots um, or even cabbage. So when growing biennials for seed, it's really helpful to plant at a smaller size than you would plant otherwise if you were planting just for market production. 
and it's also helpful to plant extra as you can expect to lose some of that those plants through the winter. So how do you decide how much seed to grow? Well, firstly, you need to think about what you want to do with your seed. What are your goals? Do you want to grow enough seed for yourself for three years to plant? Do you want to be able to share with five friends or 10 friends? How much seed do you actually want to harvest? Uh, then you start to think about how much seed each plant has the potential to make. And from there, how much seed can you actually harvest from five bed feet of plants? or 50 bed feet of plants. And it's important to keep in mind that you won't actually be able to harvest and collect close to all the seed that the plants make. So we need to think about what that translates to in the field. And from there, how much seed you need to actually have to do that. It's also really helpful and important to add a buffer, a buffer factor for both the greenhouse the field and for processing um, and kind of taking into account that you're going to lose some plants potentially in the greenhouse, in the field, and lose seed during the processing stage. And then lastly, we also want to think about population size recommendations. Um, population sizes are a kind of general recommended amount of plants that one should grow in order to keep a wide enough genetic pool so that down the line, we don't see something called inbreeding depression where the plant starts to just lose a little bit of vigor um, because it doesn't have a wide enough genetic pool. This can happen with corn, for example, if you are not saving a wide enough uh, population for corn, your corn plants may decline in vigor and health over time. And then when crop planning for seed, we also want to think about other considerations like space, microclimate, and structures. Um, some crops need more space when you're growing them for seed, while others are just as needing the same amount of space as you would need if growing it for market or for eating. Uh, and also thinking about microclimate in your land. Are there areas that are drier, wetter, hotter, shadier? Um, are the plants going to need some support, like a fence or a building or a trellis? So we will go through some foundational concepts related to just thinking about seed saving so that hopefully folks have a sense of what kinds of questions to think about and ask when you're thinking about growing a crop for seed. I like to say, um, start off with intention. Being intentional is really important. Starting off small and being successful is super helpful when growing your seed knowledge and um, growing your practice of seed stewardship. You wanna be able to make sure that you have the space, time and resources to grow seed that you want successfully um, and know that you have the equipment, supplies, or processing tools to properly clean and store and um, contain your seed. Record keeping is very, very helpful when growing your practice of seed saving. I recommend record recording everything, really. Um, planting times, dates, amounts of things, varieties, even things like problems and challenges, because that helps you adjust in the future and learn from your growing practice. Um, healthy soil is a very, very important part of growing seeds. And this, of course, um, relates to how you think about your whole system, um, how, you how you build your soil ecosystem and manage your soil health is super important in growing healthy seeds. We also want to think about what kinds of diseases are a risk for you in your climate because with seed crops those are usually in the ground much longer than just um, an eating or market crop so the risk and challenge of disease mitigation is even greater. So sometimes 
doing practices like trellising, spacing out your plants more, or staking can also help mitigate disease. Thinking about irrigation is also critical. Um, overhead irrigation or improper irrigation can also impact seed quality um, and seed longevity. Pollinators, as we mentioned, are incredibly important in having a good seed set and good seed quality. And then lastly, we need to learn how to think about timing and understanding when to properly harvest for seed. So a big part of this is learning the maturity indicators on each crop. And generally we want to leave things in the field as long as possible, but it's always kind of a balance between leaving things in the field as long as possible and avoiding um, pest, damage, pest damage, birds, weather, um, seed shattering, um, et cetera. So those are the things those are the things to think about, or even wind dispersion. And if you need to bring in your seed early, one thing that can be helpful is partially processing your seed and then having less sort of biomaterial stored with your seed as you're storing it until a later time when you can actually clean it fully. On the left is a um, barley trial from a few years back. And you can see that these barley heads were all harvested at the same time, but they have really, really different levels of maturity. Um, the right hand side is an image of a cucumber from our Asian cucumber trials this year. Um, and you can see you would not want to eat this cucumber at this stage, but this is getting to the stage when you would want to collect fully mature seed. Another question to ask is, will your seed be processed in a wet processing method, uh, such as tomatoes, on the left, the cucumbers on the right, other things that might be processed in this way are tomatillos, um, peppers, other melons, or in a dry processing technique. So our last little segment here is thinking about mating systems and a little bit of plant reproductive biology. I don't like want to get too scientific, but actually knowing a little bit about the flowers uh, and their parts um, will really help you know how they produce seeds and how likely they are to cross pollinate. And therefore, how you need to think about isolation distance in order to keep your seed varieties maintained. So there's three types of flower setups um, or forms really. There are bisexual flowers, which have all of the parts for reproduction in one flower. Um, they're also considered perfect flowers. And we also have monaceous flowers um, or flowers where they may be housed on the same plant, but there's actually separate pollen producing and pollen receiving flowers such as in the cucurbit family, where we see here with squash. Um, on the right-hand side, there is a pollen producing flower. You can see those anthers covered in yellow pollen. And on the left-hand side, you can actually see the pollen receiving parts. So this is another type of flower format that is helpful to know about. And then lastly, there's also plants that have another format, it's called dioecious, where there's actually separate plants that have pollen producing and pollen receiving plants. This is a spinach plant. And so you actually need more than one spinach plant um, if you're gonna have seed pollination. You need both pollen producing and pollen receiving plants. So seeds and fruits are formed um, in two ways, plants can either self-pollinate and fertilize themselves, such as things that you see on the left with eggplant. You can actually see uh, all of those um, 
the pollen receiving parts are enclosed in the pollen producing parts or with peas where all of the all of the pollen producing and pollen receiving parts are actually protected within the corolla or the petals. Um, the other option is cross pollination where plants are openly sharing pollen um, and fertilizing other plants besides themselves like corn on the right hand side. And while some plants have all of the parts necessary to pollinate themselves, they're actually self incompatible, which is a strategy for plants to encourage genetic diversity, such as in some of the brassica family things. Um, so even though you can see this, this flower has both pollen producing parts and pollen receiving parts, the pollen either may not be viable at the time when it drops onto the pollen receiving parts or it um, it will actually um, not have the right genetic genetics to be received. And then lastly, we also want to think about um, wild weeds or even other plants on our farms that we may have not intentionally planted but that can actually cross with the plants that we're growing for seed. For instance, here is wild radish and radish being grown for seed, which are extremely similar looking and they can definitely share pollen and cross pollinate. Like a lot of other things in life and in plants, these things also exist on a spectrum of plant expression. On the left hand side, you'll see a tomato flower, which has a pretty um, inserted stigma. It's actually hidden within. Whereas on the right hand side, you'll see a tomato flower with a fairly exerted stigma. And this one on the right has a much, much higher likelihood of cross pollinating with another tomato variety because that stigma is out in the open. And so we can see that even within one type of crop, there's a, there's a range of how cross pollination works. So this is really a matter of you getting to know your plants, learning about what their flowers look like. Cross pollination can also depend on the temperatures and how viable the pollen is able to travel and how likely it is able to travel the insect presence in your fields um, or your garden. Things are actually more likely to cross pollinate in organic fields with lots of beneficial insects. So it's just a matter of getting to know your plants and your farm and garden system. Okay, so that's all my slides for now. I'll turn it back over to you, Elise. Thank you so much. I'm, that was uh, that had to be stressful for you. <laughs> okay, thank you for all the great information. We got some good questions coming up, but first I want to mention some other virtual events that are happening, and and a few not virtual. Um, we have got um, a an insights into conducting long term evaluation of a beginning farmer training program. This will be a uh, weekday, midday um, academic presentation for anybody who is interested. You can find it on the CASFIS uh, website calendar. And then for everybody in this class or everyone who signed up for it, um, on the 12th, which I believe is a Sunday, we will have a seed exchange. So bring some seeds, take some seeds. It's gonna be outside at the barn. You're going to have to register for it, and you're going to have to fill out a little COVID symptom check. So that will be an in-person event, and um, it will be only be um, sent out to those of you who registered for this class. September 22, uh, Paula Granger, who's a local famous herbalist, is going to go over top 10 medicinal herbs that you can grow in your own backyard. And if you happen to be a member of the Friends of the Farm and Garden, there's going to be a limited access 10 people um, event that is going to happen afterwards, 
where we actually get to walk through her backyard and look at these plants. And then November 2nd, Grow Great Garlic. Uh, Pete Rasmussen, who's um, grown farmed garlic in, I believe, Utah, is going to be presenting uh, a class he hasn't done in about three years for us. And it's really interesting. And you'll really grow great garlic after that. We'll also be selling garlic, uh, seed garlic, certified disease free for that and a first come, first serve basis. So those are some things to look for. Next slide. And now we have some questions for you. All righty. Um, so someone asked a question. She, she talked about bonnie plants, but I think what she really means are um, purchased plants. Is it, does it make sense to save seed from those kind of plants that you get at the nursery? Yeah, so that's a great question and it kind of depends on the plants and the variety. Um, I'm sort of a, a proponent for saying it always makes sense to save seed. However, it, it, it would say it sort of depends on your plant. Um, is it something that you really like and is something that you're going to continue to want to grow? and put the time and effort into saving seed. Um, and also another important question to ask is, is the plant variety an open pollinated variety or a hybrid variety? This is a really important distinction and hybrid variety, hybrid varieties can definitely be, can definitely have, you can save seed from hybrid varieties but it will not necessarily turn out true to type. So hybrid varieties are two parent lines of plants that have been intentionally crossed to produce a trait, a desired trait, whether it's earliness, color, disease resistance, et cetera. And so a lot of plants that you may grow or seedlings that you may buy from kind of commercial nurseries are often hybrid varieties that have been produced in a sort of standard way um, and may have good traits like disease resistance to a particular uh, issue. But they are, if they are hybrids, they're not going to necessarily grow true to type if you save those seeds. Um, so hybrid seeds are a somewhat challenge to navigate um, when thinking about seed saving. Um, and that's my main response to that question is sort of, it depends on the seed quality, whether you liked it and what the type of seed is, what the type of crop is. And also if it's something that will cross pollinate with other things or sort of be easy to manage in a fairly simple way, like a lettuce plant. Okay, great. Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my list here. <clears throat> Please show up list. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Uh, oh, what does it mean to grow for climate resistance? What does that mean? What does that mean? I feel that it is kind of pushing plants to be less coddled and really leaning into their ability to adapt and thrive with less inputs, potentially less water, um, and being able to survive, you know, lower end temperatures, higher end temperatures. Um, in our climate here, drought tolerance is always a big one. So if we can grow a crop and su successfully select seeds for something that has maybe been pushed to have a little less water than it than we might usually water. Um, those seeds are going to have that memory and that knowledge of being a little bit more drought tolerant. And if they were able to thrive, if that plant was still able to be fairly healthy, um, you're going to be able to continue to select and push that trait to need less water and be able to survive in the future. 
Um, so that's that's one example um, that we think about in our climate. But of course, there's many, many other concerns, you know, depending on what your growing region is. Some people are thinking about overly wet conditions, which is not necessarily, um, you know, what we have here or rain at different times of the year or different temperatures. Uh, but usually here we're thinking about drought and sort of uh, more erratic conditions in general. Okay. So how do seeds need to dry on the plant to be viable? At what point can you pull a plant out to get the, to reuse the space and and mm -hmm you know, have the seeds still mature? Yeah, this is a good question because it's always a little bit of a, a gamble of how long you can keep things in the field and wanting to change things into cover crop or grow something else. And it sort of depends a little bit on the, on the specific plant and getting to know what it needs. However, um, seeds can often mature quite well once you remove the actual plant from the ground, if you have a plant where you're still having the seeds in the seed pod and attached to the plant, that gives it a much better chance of getting the rest of the energy from the plant. Like we did with the perilla, um, actually cutting and pulling the whole plant out and letting it finish in the greenhouse versus just sort of clipping off the flower heads or just shaking out the seeds taking that whole plant, um, even roots and all, can actually give your seeds a much better chance to get all that energy from the plant and finish. And um, you can, when you're looking at seeds, you can kind of see the color difference in their maturity. Um, usually if there's a change in their color from, white or light to tan or medium tan, they can usually go to the full range of mature if they've already started kind of reaching that tan phase, but it also depends on the plant. Um, so I recommend if possible, retaining as much of your plant, the full plant with the seed if possible, if you need to move your, you know, clear your garden or clear that space out. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of, of gardeners who, uh, this one person has grown seven or eight uh, tomato varieties and three or four types of cucumbers. And will they cross pollinate? How far apart do they have to be? And we had the same kind of a question for peppers. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, tomatoes, are, so I should send out in the notes, we'll actually send out a chart which has uh, um, distance ranges for how much you need to cross pollinate. You can also find this online. Um, there's a really great book called The Seed Garden by Seed Savers Exchange, which has a bunch of different charts on isolation, isolation distance requirements. Um, but briefly, I'll say that tomatoes are generally fairly self-pollinating. So if you separate them, you know, just by five, 10 feet in our climate, that's usually sufficient. Um, cucumbers are much, much more promiscuous. All things in the cucurbit family love to cross around. So that's definitely, um, a challenge to manage cross-pollination if you have them growing close together. Cucurbits, you know, squashes and things are often something that people will actually hand pollinate in order to manage um, cross-pollination challenges. And then there was one other crop in there, peppers. Peppers are somewhere in the middle where they do cross-pollinate and they are often um, they, they can self-pollinate, but they will cross-pollinate, particularly if insects are roaming around. So last year when I did seed preservation for 11 different chili pepper varieties, I had to cover 
each of the varieties separately with row cover to essentially exclude insect cross-pollination. Um, and that was how I managed to grow them in the same field, but still have fairly pure um, seed isolation and prevention of cross-pollination. Okay, so far apart or barrier? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and did you talk about time? I did not talk about time. Thanks for mentioning that, Delise. So time is another way that you can isolate, um, particularly if you don't have space to, you know, have fields or hundreds of feet apart from between things. You can always stagger your flowering time, which is really helpful for something like corn. Corn is needing a huge isolation distance. Um, we actually have three rounds of corn here. And luckily, um, they are timed in a particular way where none of the tassels and the silks are open at the same time. So that's another way that you can manage cross-pollination concerns is by making sure that nothing that's flowering that will cross-pollinate is flowering at the same time as your crop. We've had a couple of questions about storing seeds in a refrigerator, in a jar, in a cupboard, what how cold is cold enough um how long will they live can you um speak to that a bit sure how how long will they live is <laughs> that's a wild question because there have been seeds that have been excavated from various different archaeological sites that are four thousand years old and have been grown um successfully so how long can they live? It depends. And the best way to store seeds is in a place that's dry. So even if your refrigerator is cold, if it's not totally moisture free and dry, it's not a good place for them. Um, so I have stored seeds in the freezer or in the fridge, but you want to make sure that you have an airtight situation where no moisture is getting in. And then when you remove those seeds from the refrigerator or the freezer, you actually want to let them come up to temperature before opening them so that moisture doesn't condense. So that's a that's a big one. Um, here at the farm, we basically just have all our seeds in a, in a really dark closet, essentially, with no windows. Um, and that is a really great place. It's cool and it's dark. Um, and temperature, changing temperature is also another big thing. So if you can have a place that's a more consistent temperature rather than somewhere that has a huge temperature fluctuation change, that's really cold sometimes and really hot sometimes, like a garage, that's not great. So it's better to have something that's more consistent and dry um, above everything else. So an ideal temperature range, you know, can be 50 degrees, 60 degrees is great. A cool closet or shed. Um, and uh, seeds are living things, you know, they're breathing, respirating uh, beings. So there is actually the, People often say the best way to store seeds is actually in the cotton or burlap where there's some ability for them to res respirate, but that's only possible if you're in a place that's super dry and you're not going to have insect issues or you're not going to have moisture and humidity issues. So we use jars here or um, envelopes, you know, in a, in a tub. Glass jars work great as long as they are dark or you're keeping them out of the light. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had a number of people ask about, you know, good books for seed saving. And I'm wondering if maybe you can put together a list that we'll send out afterwards rather than putting you on the spot right here. Yeah, I definitely will um, give you a list. But a really great one with really great images is the seed garden, as I mentioned. I really like to have very good photographs and visuals when I'm looking at plant flowers and small seeds. 
and that's one that I really recommend. Right. Um, what do we want to do now? Um, so there's a question. I don't really understand the question. I think there's a typo in it, but it's about collecting seeds from native plants for cover crops or other regenerative farming practices. Do you have anything on that? Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Maybe. So I'll read it um, verbatim and we'll see. Uh, if we can figure it out. Kelly, do you have any insights? Oh, I see. It's not inside a riot. It's insights into collecting seeds from native plants. I'm thinking maybe Phacelia, um, potentially for cover crop or regenerative farming practices. Ah, Phacelia. Interesting. I, so in terms of collecting things from the from um, non-farm or wild spaces or growing on farm spaces, I wouldn't recommend that. But if we're just talking about native species, um, Facilia is an interesting one. I know a lot of farmers that use, use Facilia as a cover crop and it's fairly easy to collect seed from, um, but that's not, some, that's not one that I have personal experience with, but I would be interested to learn about. Um, Indeed. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about the open source seed initiative? Um, I do. The open source seed initiative is essentially a, a pledge that a, a number of different seed companies, seed organizations have agreed to. And essentially they say that you know, the seeds that we are selling in our seed company can be used for any number of things. You can grow them, you can breed them, you can share them. And we're committing to not really, you not, not patenting these seeds or um, putting intellectual property restrictions on them. And so in my knowledge, you know, it hasn't actually been sort of tested and held up in court as a, as a thing, but I think as a, as a framework for creating shared language and practice, it's a great thing. Um, and a lot of companies are part of that. Okay, and Tara, who's on the call, um, can answer questions about native seed and points out that, as you said, there are ethical issues when to keep in mind when collecting wild seed. Yeah, just, definitely. Yeah, want to watch out about that. Um, we're coming to the end here. Someone, Paul, would like to know about your favorite open pollinated tomato seeds. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a great question. Um, I love tomatoes that are a little bit more sort of umami on the umami end of things and less super sweet. So some recent favorite OPs have been green zebra or sunrise bumblebee is one that we're trying this year. Um, and here in the field, they've been growing um, and saving seeds on dirty girl tomatoes for a number of years and dry farming those, um, which are always good. That was good. Nice. We kind of skipped over the dry processing slide. Can you just speak to that when we had our little disaster with technology? <laughs> sure. Um, so just to circle back to dry processing. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I thought, go for it. <laughs> yeah, there's essentially, you know, two general steps. One is the threshing or the removing of the seed from the plant, you know, and that can happen in a number of different ways, anywhere from stomping on beans on a tarp uh, to using a combine, a tractor in a combine, or to just shaking lettuce seed into a bucket. And then the second part is actually the cleaning 
or separating of the seed from the dry material that's remaining. And that, you know, depending on the scale and the type of seed you're working with can be a time intensive process. And people in the seed community develop all kinds of um, sort of DIY hacks and tricks to process different types of seed on small scale and varying scales because seeds have such a range of shape and form and weight that it's sort of difficult to create uh, seed processing equipment for, you know, for a one size fits all thing. Um, so um, it can be a, you know, a, a problem, <laughs> lifelong practice of refining and figuring out what type of winnowing process works best for your seed that you're working with. Um, and sort of figuring out what techniques you're going to use. Okay, last question here. Um, I'm going to just read it out loud. Can you speak to the significance of preserving Black women's farm history, where Black women as farmer, farmers and seed savers? Can you speak to this? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to this a scale that connects African American women to their sisters in the diaspora? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, well, I first want to say that I, I should not be the person to necessarily speak on this topic, as there are a lot of amazing um, people in the African diaspora and Black women seed stewards and seed keepers. Um, so I think, you know, I would <laughs> send you that way. Um, folks at Soul Fire Farm are doing seed preservation work, and there's a lot of folks through um, True Love Seeds that are doing that work. Um, but I will say in general, I think seed work through any, the diaspora of any community is just such a powerful way to retain a living community legacy and sort of culture and keep practicing tradition and um, food ways and ritual and ceremony. And um, it's through keeping living relationship with our seeds um, that this is the way that we're able to do that. Um, so I feel that um, connecting the seeds of our various diaspora to um, you know, mother, motherlands is it's a really critical part of this of this work um, and I'm I, you know I, I'm really there's a lot of people that I really admire that are doing that work as well um, so thank you for that question um, I wanted to just I wanted to just recircle back to the question and just uh, that Tara was mentioning about the ethical issues when collecting wild seed um, just to highlight that that is a real issue uh, and concern, um, particularly when we're seeing people try and um, market various wild seed for pollinator use or for planting native gardens or what any, you know, um, I think any kind of collecting of seed from spaces like that is, um, it has real challenges and impacts on the ecosystem. Um, and we're seeing huge, uh, we're seeing huge problems with that. So I just wanna highlight that that is a true concern and that I would not recommend <laughs> at all collecting seed from wild spaces. Um, even if you do wanna grow those plants, there's other ways to get it. Thank you for that. All right, I think that's the end of our meeting tonight. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, thank for you. joining. And thank you for joining and for keeping on, keeping on with us <laughs> through our tech issues. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another another uh, free virtual session soon. Everybody take care.